This is a review of episodes 1 through 12 of Say Rei No Morbito. If you haven't seen through episode 12 of this show, then you should not watch this video because there will be spoilers for through episode 12. First of all, this show is shaping up to be something totally different from what I expected it to be. The promise of the first few episodes made it seem like it would be a fast-paced, perilous journey through the wilderness where we'd be encountering monsters and assassins and animals and all that junk. But all of that seemed to be traded in favor of an introspective and spiritual look at the emotional journey of a small group of people. I was so into the initial premise of the show that I thought I was getting that I almost didn't notice when it changed, and once I did notice that it changed, I didn't really care because I was so invested in the characters. I think that the show is working through some character development right now and is working up to the next year when the egg will hatch and the presumed drought will appear. It's not entirely obvious what will emerge from the egg, whether it will be good or evil. It doesn't seem to have much of an influence on Chagum's behavior or his feelings or anything like that. Though the title of the anime itself is a bit misleading, because you are left wondering whether the guardian of the spirit is Chagum or if it's Balsa. The strong points of this show are definitely the interesting characters and this universe that we've been thrown into. All around, although there are some pacing issues, I think it is a really smart and strong start to a series. I'm a little taken aback by the fact that this show doesn't really have a villain. There are people who want to kill the protagonists, but not for any malicious reasons. We see their points of view and why they're doing what they're doing, and in their defense it's not for the sake of a fake prophecy or a fake religion. It's not like the Emperor feels like killing his son, so therefore he makes up something like the spirit possessed him, or anything like that. Chagum is legitimately possessed by a water spirit or demon, and when the king believes that he is dead, he mourns for him, for realsies. At the initial start of the series, I didn't realize that spirits and all that kind of magic stuff was actually going to exist in this world, and I thought that maybe we were going to go down the, the road that the king or the first prince were secretly evil and they wanted to kill Chagum for some reason that we didn't know yet. And if that had happened, then it would have warranted an oh snap in the moment, but other than that it would have been pretty forgettable because it's been done before. Chagum's honest possession and his family's human regret over this possession and what has to be done because of it makes the show very memorable in my opinion, and I think it'll help me remember it when I'm thinking back. Everyone in this show believes that the thing that they are doing is the best for the overall greater good. Actually, one could argue that Balsa and Chagum are the ones in the wrong for selfishly not considering the fact that this drought will kill a lot of people. But somehow I feel like there's a case of misinterpretation going on here, and there is a chance that after we get to the point where the egg is hatching, we might find another solution. Chagum himself is a bit unconventional, and acts differently than how you would expect a prince, or even just an average person, to act in his situation. He went along with Balsa and did what he was told, even though it was such a drastic change to his life. I'm not sure that he was able to grasp that this was a permanent arrangement until about when he got his hair cut, because there was a degree of shock in response to all the crazy stuff that was happening around him. And by that point, it's not as though he could do anything about it, so he just approached everything with a very open mind. I like it when we get little glimpses of the subtleties that differentiate him from normal children. He's accustomed to feeling bored and lonely, so he doesn't start complaining or whining when he's feeling isolated or left out. It's pretty different from the bratty attention-seeking behavior that I was going... It's pretty different from the bratty attention-seeking behavior that I was expecting him to have, like in The Emperor's New Groove. He was thrust into the arms of someone he didn't even know, and instructed to entrust her implicitly, and I think he's turning out to be a pretty agreeable and all-around good kid. All throughout his childhood, he was kept away from the general public, and only exposed to a very chosen few group of people. And even when he was taken outside, no one ever looked at him because they thought they would go blind if they did. So the average person doesn't know what he looks like or that his name is even Chagum. 
I like when he was having a conversation with Balsa and she casually brought up like, hey, would you ever want to go back to being a prince? And he sort of haphazardly was like, no, I, no, I'm not interested. There are benefits, of course, like he didn't know the sensation of hunger, but it just doesn't seem very fun. Now Balsa, like Chagum, is very adaptable, and I think that's part of the job description of being a bodyguard. We haven't gotten a full timeline detailing Balsa's past, but we have gotten a lot of hints dropped, so we can kind of put it together and make a lot of assumptions. She knows what Chagum is going through because she's actually pretty much gone through it herself. She also apparently used to kill people in order to protect the person that she was guarding. Though it was argued that that was kind of only perpetuating the bad karma. Like, what's the sense in protecting people if you're killing more people than you're protecting? So in addition to putting this requirement on herself where she was going to protect eight people, she also recently decided that she wasn't going to kill anyone either. She also has this previously established relationship with this guy, Tanda, who definitely takes on the role of the wife. Not only does he stay at home and tend to Balsa's wounds, but he's distinctly more gentle and reserved, and can even be a little naggy at times. I think that whatever is going on between these two is very genuine, so whether they're acting like they're married, or acting like they're very good friends, or even that they're siblings, it feels real. They go way back, and you can see that in the way they talk to each other, but they are two characters who can exist independently from one another. When it comes to character traits, it's one of my biggest turnoffs if a character cannot exist successfully without a love interest, or a boyfriend, or a girlfriend, or something. It's just an indication of a flat character, and I think the situation is especially precarious for female anime characters who are almost always there to just sort of be the prize for the male hero. Balsa is her own complete character separate from Tanda, even though I have to admit I would love it if they got married and had babies. Balsa and Chagam are meant to be the protagonists, but there are people around them which serve for development. The two kids, Saya and Toya, admittedly annoyed me at first, but then I got used to them and they grew on me. Chagum also made some friends with some kids in town, which he frequently schools on proper behavior. Then there was also that swordsmith dude, who debated for an entire episode with whether he wanted to turn them in or not. That episode was, I think, meant to set up the notion that there's no concrete evil side. I think while the smithy was listening to both sides of the stories, we were expected to as well, so we came to understand the dueling points of view. Those guards were introduced as assassins, but gradually over time we've come to know them as more humans, especially Jin, the one who respects and admires the prince. They don't want to kill Chagum, but they do it because they believe it's what's best for everyone. It's like when Balsa and Chagum faked their deaths by falling off the mountain, and the captain immediately goes running for him, instinctively calling out for Chagum to rescue him, even though they wanted him dead. Even Shuga, who can't even really be sure if Chagum is actually dead, got all sentimental about his belongings, because as his teacher, he came to respect him as a prince and as an individual. The universe that this show is set in is a little bit confusing for me, because I think I spent a long time not realizing that spirits and star diviners and all of that kind of stuff was real. It seems like the magic and supernatural stuff exists in this universe, and everyone knows it exists, but it's not necessarily part of everyone's everyday life. I'm gonna come right out and say that I'm not a spiritual person, so my instinct is to say that spirits and star diviners and all of that kind of stuff is hogwash and it's all just like a fraud and they're they're trying to scam you into believing that the prince is possessed so a b and c and that kind of stuff but they constantly remind us that this stuff is real like when toro guy puts her face into chagum's chest to look at the egg or when tanda's diagnosis for a sick child was that her soul had left her, and it turned out that her soul actually did leave her, and he went off and had this little adventure recovering her soul. I like the way they juxtapose the fun and sort of easygoing life of the commoner versus the formal and rule-filled way of the princes. 
I think what they're trying to do is show the rigid up against the lax, although I do sometimes feel like they're a little too rosy on the poor side. There have been a few mild indications that it's not so awesome to be poor, but I think between the two, we as viewers are supposed to view the poor side as the better choice. Then again, we haven't really seen anything besides the super poor or the super rich, but Balsa's never really had trouble with money, so maybe the super poor just kind of look super poor and they're actually just, you know, middle class. This show is different from what I expected, and even from what I wanted, but in a good way. I like a lot of the choices they made with the characters and the plot, and I can see where they're going with it. Toro Guy told us to wait a year for the egg to hatch, which is when the drought is going to come. Time could continue to pass naturally throughout the series, or we could get a time skip ahead a couple of months. Either way, I don't think that um, action is very far off, and I think that we're going to see some beautifully animated spear fights in the near future. I'll see you next time for episodes 13 and 14. Bye! He's accustomed to being bored and lonely, so he doesn't complain or whine when he's feeling left out. Or... or... or what? I like the way they juxtapose... Ju 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 